is a community-driven initiative geared at developing and connecting research clusters in Nigeria to a high-speed capacity backbone network. And the reason for this is to be able to encourage researchers to exploit the large volumes of data that come out of research for impact and content generation and collaboration. Our primary goal is to provide a secure and inclusive collaboration platform for our Nigerian researchers and students. Um, and we provide services such as uh, identity and access management, education, well, Wi-Fi roaming. All of this is geared towards increasing scholarly outputs and scientific innovation that contributes to national development. The Echo Connect uh, platform is specifically geared at the research and education community and the services and infrastructure that is provided through the platforms we build is specific to education. These include boot camps, hackfest and capacity building programs geared at developing digital literacy, youth development and gender balance within our community. They sometimes look similar to services that can be found within the general internet community, but these are architected and designed for optimal use by the research and education community. Yeah. GoConnect is a community-driven initiative geared at developing and connecting research clusters in Nigeria to a high-speed capacity backbone network. And the reason for this is to be able to encourage researchers to... <clears throat> All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Owen Yoha. Um, I'm the um, MD of Echo Connect Research and Education Initiative. And I'd like to welcome you all to um, the conference. We're going to start uh, promptly today. So um, I want to thank all of you for giving your time and your data to, to join us for, for this conference. Um, um, as we all know, the uh, coronavirus pandemic has had a major impact on all our lives and has affected the way we work. And obviously this is the reason why this year's conference is virtual. Um, COVID-19 has also impacted our work practice to put a spotlight on the lack of infrastructure in the research and education sector. And it's raised questions about the future of education and research in Nigeria. So the theme of this year's conference is resilient infrastructures. Is resilient infrastructures shaping the future of education and research in Nigeria. Um, so over the next three days, we'll be looking at different aspects of our research and education ecosystem to discuss what needs to be done and how we as a research and education community need to adapt um, our practices and adapt new methods, tools and infrastructure in these new um, COVID circumstances. Um, so um, the whole idea here with uh, all of the sessions that will be taking place today and tomorrow is that we've got panelists who are experts in their field who will talk about some of these issues um, after they've done their presentations, um, we'll then engage in a kind of interactive question and answer session um, with how to look at some of the topics that have been raised and what we need to do um, moving, moving forward. Um, just before I introduce you to our moderator for today's session, um, some of the protocols that need to be observed would be um, one, during the course of the presentations by each of the speakers, if you do have any questions, I think uh, what we would like you to do is put those questions into the, um, 
the uh, question and the Q and A icon at the uh, bottom of your screen, or you you'll see the icon for Q and A. Or alternatively, you can put that in the chat window. Um, and we'd like maybe for you to allow all the presenters to speak before we um, would uh, look at maybe all of the questions that are are raised in the interactive part of the interactive part of this um, this session. Um, if you do need to speak uh, during the Q and A session, just click on the raise hand icon, and um, at some point you will be acknowledged and uh, allowed to uh, ask your question. I think by default all of your microphones will be muted, but uh, those who want to speak during the Q and A uh, part of the um, session uh, will enable your microphone to ask a question or make some contribution to the discussion. So without much ado, let me introduce um, Professor Charles Wadia, who is the moderator for this first session of the user conference. And this, se this session is titled the state of the art platforms for research and education, communication and collaboration. Um, Professor Charles Wadia is a professor of computer science at the Department of Science, Computer Sciences, University of Lagos. His areas of specialization are software engineering, computer architecture, communications and network systems. He holds a BSc in computer science from the University of Ibadan, an MSc in computer science from University of Lagos, and also a PhD in computer science from the University of Lagos. Um, Professor Wadia has served in the University of Lagos in various capacities, including acting head of department from 1996 to 1998, acting director of Computer Center 2003 to 2005, director Center for Information Technology and Systems 2005 to 2013, um, head of department from 2013 to 2016, and he has over 80 academic publications in reputable local and international media. He's a member of ACM, IEEE, and a fellow of the Nigerian Computer Society. He has served in the IT community in Nigeria in various capacities, including President Nigerian Computer Society from 2007 to 2011, President and Chairman in Council Computer Professionals Registration Council of Nigeria from 2017 to date, and more, pertinent, more pertinently to us, he's actually the chair of uh, Echo Connect Research and Education Initiative. So, uh, Prof, sir, I hand over the mic to you, so to speak. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yoha. Uh, once again, good morning to you all, distinguished participants. It's a pleasure having you here, I hope, uh, Everybody's keeping safe from uh, this second wave of a uh, pandemic. Uh, this session has the theme, state-of-the-art platforms for research and education, communication, and collaboration. Uh, basically, the session will discuss affordable connectivity and how to get fiber and data center capacity needed for our campuses. The session will also feature insights on modern platforms for scholarly communication and research collaboration and their deployment here in Nigeria. The panel will explore the need for competition among the infrastructure stakeholders for the benefit of a uh, the Iran community and their national development. Uh, we have um, three session speakers. And uh, the three of them, I must confess, they are, are five-star generals as far as uh, the industry is concerned. Uh, Saike Chukun Namani, 
the CEO medallion, communications, and then is the president, current president of Atcon. Then I will have a Mr. Kazim Oladapo, I hope. I, I, Oladipo, I'm sorry. Oladipo, VP IHS Nigeria Limited. And then uh, the last but not the least, Sawali Abu, the CEO Liquid Telecoms. Those are the three speakers. And um, I would uh, start by introducing the speakers. Engineer Ikechuko Namani, like I said earlier, is the CEO of Medallion Communication Limited with a core vision of bridging the digital divide between nations. He integrates technologies for practical solutions. Engineer Namani focuses on implementing the core network infrastructure that promotes, develops, and distributes local content and ensuring a high quality of service is delivered to the subscribers at an affordable price. He is very active in promoting forward-looking industry policies for the growth of the telecom industry across Africa, working with both regulators as well as operators to achieve this goal. He currently acts as an executive of the premier telecom body in Nigeria. That's the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria, ATCOM, where he is currently the president. He also serves as an executive board member of the Nigerian Internet Registration Association, uh, NIRA, the organization responsible for managing Nigeria's country code top level domain name, uh, the dot ng tld. Engineer Namani holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nigeria, Nsuka and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Tennessee State University, Nashville, United States of America. Uh, I think that's just a, a, a summary of uh, Engineer Ikechuku Namani's uh, profile. Prof, Azim. Prof, just before you continue, sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see okay. your face. We just oh, really? see, we're just seeing your chin. Ah, sorry. Ah, uh, now we can see you. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yes. Now we can see you, sir. I'm sorry about that. That's all right, sir. Okay. Mr. Kazim or Ladipu, I hope I'm correct by that pronunciation. Is Mr. Ladipu online? Yes, Prof. Uh, prof, you are okay. correct, sir. It's Oladipu, not Oladaku, I hope. Uh, it's at, the O is silent, it's Ladipo. Well, that's right. Ladipo, okay, thank you. Mr. Kazim Ladipo joined the IHS Towers Group in October 2020 as Vice President in charge of GICL, an NCC licensed IHS subsidiary focused on connectivity, that is FTTT and uh, FTTX rural telephony and value added services, that is IOT and edge DC across Nigeria. He has 14 years diverse C-level experience in business strategy and operations across West Africa. It focus on business development and commercial transactions, sales and marketing corporate and project finance, legal, regulatory and compliance, project management, and corporate strategy. Mr. Wale Abu is the Chief Executive Officer of Liquid Telecom, Nigeria. 
Prior to his appointment at Liquid Telecom, Mr. Abu served as the CEO of Pan African Towers Limited, PAT. And before that, as the Vice President of Sales at Airtel Nigeria, where he also held several senior management roles in the human resources, engineering operations, finance, legal, and marketing departments, respectively. This polyfocal blend of functional skills makes Mr. Abu a very experienced leader in the telecom sector, as he is poised to bridge the gap in connectivity in Africa in an environmentally sustainable fashion. Mr. Abu, in his storage career, has also managed across startups and mature companies leading these businesses into periods of massive and rapid growth through new business service rollouts, while driving positive change in the respective companies. Mr. Abu is a member of the Project Management Institute and volunteers regularly for courses that project families and empowers communities. Distinguished participants, uh, that's the profile of our speakers. Uh, you will agree with me that we have uh, quite some uh, exciting uh, time ahead of us. Who allow the panelists each to make a presentation for 15 minutes. Each panelist will present for 15 minutes. And uh, like Mr. Yua said earlier, we'll allow the panelists to present in tongues. And then uh, after that, we'll uh, have uh, a roundtable discussion. The roundtable discussion will be in form of uh, questions which will be posted on the chat box. It could be in form of uh, observations, comments, in which case would uh, allow you to, you have to indicate interest by raising up your hands. It will allow you to make your contributions. I think that will be the format. And then at the end of the roundtable discussion, we would, uh, we will close by giving the speakers about a minute each to round up and summarize, kind of summarize your presentations. That will be the format. So I'll Call on Engineer Ikechuku Namani. Engineer Namani, I hope you are online. Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, Prof. Um, thanks, everyone. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the floor. Please uh, go ahead and do your presentation. Good morning to you. Oh, thank you. Um, once again, I uh, thank everybody that's um, able to participate in this event. Um, we have associated with the uh, education and research uh, community uh, for many years now, uh, both uh, from a corporate standpoint, uh, Medallion as a data center operator, and also from a personal perspective, being that one believes in the need to have a very robust um, research network for the education community uh, within the country. Um, so it's a sector that I personally am very passionate about and that's why I do everything possible to ensure the success in any activity that involves uh, the, 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 the group 
you know, uh, in one form or the other. So it is a honor and privilege to join you guys today. And my hope is that at the end of this year's uh, conference, there will be some far reaching uh, decisions that will move the um, group uh, forward. If I may use the word group to describe the um, various uh, organizations and stakeholders that is involved uh, in this particular area. Um, the issue of infrastructure for the um, Educational Research Network is one that is always looked from the standpoint of a catch-22 situation when it comes to service provision. Uh, reason being that you always want to balance uh, the need of the um, education community um, which is uh, making sure they receive the adequate infrastructure at the right quality um, to serve the specific need of that uh, community versus the potential costs of delivering the service to the community um, versus also offering it to the non-education community. There's always been a big imbalance um, when we enter that particular uh, sector of conversation. Uh, I know this for sure because for many years, uh, as I said, we've been actively involved uh, with the community, um, both from the um, national level, where we are one of the hosting organizations for NG Rain, um, which covers the country, as well as uh, working in close partnership with EcoConnect, which um, is for the Southwest uh, region, and also working with the parties promoting that for other regions of the country. And then on the international side, being a hosting company for WACREN, which also handles the international arm um, of uh, the research network uh, infrastructure. So because we've been involved in the three sectors, uh, regional, national, um, international. In fact, I can go a step further to say state, because we also were, did some stuff for some of the schools in particular within the Southwest region. Then uh, I'm in a position to understand the challenges uh, that comes to play when one wants to balance um, the four infrastructure that is needed, uh, which is, um, data center at the, as a core of uh, a hosting uh, um, facility uh, transmission, which has to do with the both uh, metro and long distance and then the international connectivity arm um, of uh, connecting the data center to the various uh, institutions, then the access network within the institutions to ensure that users within the various institutions are able to have access to uh, ICT infrastructure within their locality, you, you know, and then content, which has to also do with making sure that there is adequate uh, access to the right content uh, to make all this work. So within those four subdivisions, uh, it's always uh, interesting when one wants to balance the need of the um, uh, education subsector with the rest of the world. And this comes to play because in the case of Nigeria, we don't have the adequate infrastructure in place nationwide. Um, this goes beyond the education network. It goes beyond the need of the education subsector of the country. Uh, from a general perspective, whether you are looking at the business community or you are looking at the private users, the infrastructure is just not there uh, across this four sector. Whether you are discussing uh, data centers, uh, we still don't have data centers in as many locations within the country as possible. Lagos is well served for now. But beyond Lagos, uh, plus or minus, you could throw in a few in Abuja, the rest of the country really is starved 
of uh, good data center uh, that could be used uh, both from beyond education, just generally for the country. And the same thing happens when it comes to transmission. Again, beyond uh, Lagos and a few big cities, there's uh, absence of uh, adequate um, metro connectivity, be it uh, fiber, be it microwave, and the rest of it at an affordable price point uh, to serve the country. So there's also, there's already uh, a situation of um, um, scarcity uh, when it comes to even the infrastructure, you know, from a national perspective. So, um, and, and this goes on and on. Yes, maybe there could be content at the uh, education research network site that is adequate, uh, that is subject to review because if you take away what ECHO Connect is doing in the area of content, uh, you may not see much uh, beyond the higher institutions that are connected within ECHO Con uh, Connect, uh, you know, network. So it, it's still a challenge even with content. Of course, international side, we all know what's happening there. So the, the point I'm trying to get at is because in one of the comments by Prof, he had said, how do we ensure there's competition among provi providers of these services and all that, how do we privilege on it? And the bigger challenge is not even um, the competitions among people. You, you, you start talking of competition where you have sufficient uh, supply and then you start um, playing with how do you privilege on the fact that there is excess supply to, to, to create some element of competition. The reality now is there's insufficient supply. So the few that have the right infrastructure and are able to make it available, the bigger challenge is now how does the uh, education community compete with the rest of the society who are ready to pay a higher price, to, ready to pay a premium for this quote unquote uh, scarce uh, infrastructure. That seems to be the, the bigger challenge um, uh, confronting the country. And what we need to also look at is, which is where I think um, the, the Echo Connect team that I've closely worked with have done a good job is how do you aggregate uh, demand in such a way that you can price or you can uh, approach the infrastructure providers, you know, collectively instead of each institution going and getting small capacity and being charged at a higher price point, how do you aggregate uh, your demand, you know, um, in such a way that um, the unit price can come down for everybody? I know that is a very important uh, part of the conversation that needs to be had, um, you know, because one challenge we've seen uh, and I saw this in some projects I've done uh, beyond Lagos uh, as a state, where you want to provision uh, infrastructure for a remote school. Uh, as a service provider, one is gonna cost you more to be able to take the fiber, microwave, and the rest of the, the bandwidth to that remote school. Then suddenly you are confronted with a bigger challenge. The bigger challenge is that typically, if you do your business plan, you want to have constant usage. You want to have uh, the infrastructure available uh, month to month to be sure that people are using it and you can generate your monthly revenue. But with the education system, you suddenly notice that there are periods within the year when they are not in section. Um, so the big challenge now becomes, how do you generate revenue during those periods when the uh, institutions are not in section, whether it's a traditional uh, holidays period within schools or they're, they're on strike, you, you know, or in the case of what we are witnessing now, there are COVID uh, related restrictions that makes uh, the schools, some of them uh, shut down, you, you know. so. It becomes a challenge when you know that that same resource you want to commit in terms of finance to provide that infrastructure, you can also provide that same uh, resource 
So if location outside of the uh, institutions where your usage will constantly be there and you are assured constant generation of revenue. So it becomes a very tricky balancing act that um, you, you want to do as a service provider and it's a decision you have to make. Now, if um, the service is being paid for on an annual basis, you can say, okay, it doesn't matter whether it's used or not, it's been paid for. But we also know, and I speak uh, from our personal experience interacting with the community, that uh, apart from maybe work crime that can give 15 year contract and the rest like we have with them, um, the rest of them want to pay month by month or quarterly basis, right? Just because of cash flow. Uh, I see Owen is smiling. He knows the kind of conversations we have when it comes to <laughs> cash flow issues, you know. So, but it's what it is, you, you know. Um, you know, and those are the issues we need to address. So, when you look at all this, uh, there, there seems to be purely from a state of the country standpoint, um, a lot of challenge that still needs to be um, overcome. Uh, in the provision of the right infrastructure, but um, also realizing the need for this, which is what I've always said that uh, in other parts of the world, where one has been privileged to acquire education and also work uh, or be part of um, a research organization. When I did my master's, I schooled under a research scholarship so I, my master's was done under a research lab. So I fully understand how you could have access to softwares within the research community that typically you can't have outside of that community. I also understood how um, the infrastructure that makes this happen is supported externally. Uh, for instance, doing my master's, uh, and that can be practical, my research work was first was sponsored by Bori in aerospace, and then the second research was sponsored by the US Navy, you know. So they paid for it. They paid for my scholarship. They paid for the research work. They paid to maintain this research lab from those scholarships. Now, in the case of Nigeria, um, we don't have this, you know. NUC kind of supports uh, NGRN uh, through the federal government. Um, Eco Connect and the rest of them keep looking for funding. Wakren was there to also provide something, but there is not a lot more of, of this. And I think one of the, the, instead of constantly coming to see how can we get uh, scarce infrastructure at a price point that may not make sense to the service provider. So you keep getting services that is not adequate for what you need maybe part of the effort should also be get towards how do we get more funding in, you know, through some of the bigger uh, institutions and more collaboration so that um, what is the minimum amount that needs to be provided is actually available to ensure quality service is delivered to the education research community. I believe it's one area that we've not really exploit because there seems to be um, this notion that we can, as much as possible, keep negotiating with the service providers to lower the price and give it to us as an affordable price. Uh, some may be able to do that, uh, the bigger ones, maybe MTN and some of them that are sitting on a lot of uh, financial resource and they can uh, trip in some of these as part of their corporate social responsibility, but there are very few that, that can do that purely from a corporate social responsibility standpoint. Some others will rather want to do it from a partnership standpoint. Um, as I said, you, you know, uh, Boeing and the, the US Navy did not pay for my uh, scholarship and the research lab for free. I had to produce something in return for them, which is useful to them. So it was like a business relationship, you, you know, and, and that kind of worked out for everybody, especially if the research work is uh, positive in its uh, um, outcome. So that's, those are the ways I believe we need to start um, looking at this and exploring the op opportunities there. But uh, the summary of what I'm saying is that from a national standpoint, 
the infrastructure we are talking of is scarce, it's not readily available, uh, and the research and education uh, community seems to be at a disadvantage when it comes for competition to discuss uh, infrastructure, you know, in terms of uh, availability, in terms of pricing, and it's what uh, looking at, we have to look for more ways um, to support and make sure we bridge that gap so that at the end of the day, um, these things will be in place in the right way. Uh, I don't know if my 15 minutes is up, but I think uh, it's, it would be good to have others speak and then we can go into taking questions and, and the rest. Thank you guys. Thank you, Engineer Namadi. <clears throat> well, you were, you were, your flow was too smooth, so I didn't want to stop you. Uh, I think you, you, you were still within time. Eh? Uh, thank you so much for that uh, very brilliant, uh, thought provoking uh, presentation. Well, I already have uh, a few things in mind. I think uh, when we get to the discussion group, uh, this would uh, come up. Uh, let me call on. Um, so, thank you, Engineer Naman. Please, uh, I hope uh, you, you are online. Please remain online with us. Mr. Oladipo. Yeah, uh, thank Rabbit you, Prof. Thing, yeah, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. So I was just uh, thanking you for the introduction and also uh, Owen and the team. Uh, congratulations that you were able to put this together uh, despite all the challenges in the previous year. And I'm quite sure that at the end of uh, today's event, we would have had uh, very useful deliberations uh, on the uh, subject matter of the discourse. Um, I, I, I take it from where uh, uh, Engineer Namani uh, left it, just in terms of introduction, I had also been part of some of the previous uh, NREN, WACREN uh, conversation that I used to work for uh, main one uh, until last year as the head of the business in West Africa. And I remember that I did facilitate the first uh, connectivity for Wakren across West Africa, uh, I think in Abidjan, Ghana, and Nigeria uh, in the past two years. So I'm um, uh, also quite uh, conversant with the challenges, but um, the reality, taking it from where Engineer Naman left it, is um, despite all the challenges, uh, they are surmountable. Uh, and I think the uh, community is making progress uh, over the years. Uh, and these initiatives are beginning to gain uh, more and more momentum. And a lot more of the stakeholders are realizing uh, that they also need to help to promote digital uh, improvements in the quality of education and the quality of research, uh, as this forms the bedrock for building uh, a knowledge-based innovative uh, community that would ultimately help to support entrepreneurship and grow the overall economy and advancement uh, that we're all looking at as the digital age uh, takes a foothold uh, globally. Um, I think uh, essentially delivering these services uh, rank on multiple, uh, I mean, qu quite dynamic uh, factors. Uh, on one side, we, we talk so much about the infrastructure, uh, and these are in different layers. Um, you know, the connectivity aspect of it is one. Uh, the repository aspect of it, essentially talking through how do you collect and coordinate the data and the necessary research and educational information that needs to be networked through the connectivity uh, infrastructure. I mean, when people start to talk about the data centers, uh, whether they are at the edge or they are at some co-location facility, uh, that's another aspect of it. But also, uh, 
importantly, there's also the content uh, generation uh, aspects of uh, building a sustainable research and educational network, which is not necessarily uh, all infrastructure based, but uh, needs to do with having the right uh, knowledge uh, and uh, knowledge faculties and having the right uh, environment that would spur the development of uh, this content and also having the right uh, environments where they can be distributed and people can have access to them and the right incentive for the people who build those content so that uh, they're also spurred on to be more and more creative uh, in solving every day's educational and research network uh, problems. So it's it's a I think it's 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 a, it's a conglomeration of uh, of diverse uh, factors that needs to be put together uh, uh, with the proper solutions earnest uh, to deal with these uh, problems. Now, when we look at uh, what has been done so far vis-a-vis uh, -vis what needs to be done going forward. Uh, on the infrastructure side, uh, I think there have been gains, uh, and these gains have been uh, made possible, Prof, uh, people like yourself, the past 12, 15 years, uh, uh, Owen and his team, the WAPEN team across the region, uh, trying to engage the stakeholders with the wherewithal to solve this problem. So, some of those challenges have to date been uh, resolved to an extent. At least there's a connectivity network, so to speak, uh, from a global connectivity standpoint in terms of getting access to data outside of the continent. Uh, now, we're talking about access connectivity into the membership uh, location of the different REN communities, which is where I think uh, at the moment there are challenges. Uh, and those challenges, of course, will also uh, be dealing with how to solve them. Of course, I guess that's part of the conversations that we need to have uh, on this uh, on this uh, forum. Uh, but those problems are also being addressed and they will ultimately be addressed at some point with collaborations uh, between the parties. On, on the data center or the, the storage or um, the application side of things, uh, do we even have the content? Uh, are those content being developed uh, to such an extent that they provide the right incentives for uh, stakeholders, of course, to dwell on them as service areas where they can, uh, where there are investment benefits uh, and there's an incentive for them to grow the base for the rent to benefit. Uh, I think that's also something that we need to talk about the cost of this uh, forum. Now, uh, pure and simple, I think I spoke about it. Uh, you know, the, the solving these problems uh, as individual entities uh, make them very difficult. Uh, I think as uh, WACREN is done, and I think the NREN are doing, we need to strengthen alliances across the different spheres of uh, stakeholders here uh, so that the needs are aggregated and the solutions can be aggregated. Aggregating the solutions means or enables us to provide shared networks or shared services uh, where we can do better with the cost of the infrastructure and reduce the cost of providing those services uh, across the networks to the rent so that we can accelerate the uh, development that we're looking to achieve uh, amongst the rent. I think this is where a lot of the uh, conversations uh, today should focus. And now we can do that together to achieve the desired objective. Uh, I did talk about content uh, and I will be throwing this back uh, to the to, to the rent uh, because on our side uh, we provide the infrastructure. Uh, we try to dimension it uh, according to requirement, providing the right kind of scalability uh, and resilience uh, for the users. Uh, but again, uh, size and scale uh, ensures or enables us to deepen uh, the infrastructure to address 
those challenges and needs. Uh, I will speak very quickly about GICL uh, and what we are trying to do so that it does provide a background for the conversations that would come in the question and answer session so that the right uh, questions could be asked and addressed. Uh, GICL, uh, which is the company that I lead on behalf of VHS, is essentially focused on the delivery of fiber to the X, being the towers that IHS currently owns and locations that IHS customers uh, have identified to deploy fiber. I think every one of us is conversant with what the current lay of the land is. I probably have about 48,000 kilometers of fiber today in Nigeria. That is the number that the National Broadband Plan has identified. Our objective is to grow that uh, capacity by delivering uh, increased capillarities on existing fiber and building new fiber uh, across the country to achieve ultimately 50% growth of what currently exists within the next uh, two to five years, uh, and perhaps double it uh, within the next 10 years. So that's uh, basically what we're doing in addition to building rural telephony networks uh, to connect unserved and underserved areas and building edge uh, data centers uh, for bespoke uh, requirements such as the ones that we are talking about for the rent uh, across uh, micro uh, locations where requirements needs to be closer to the end users uh, and the capacity for those end users to deploy them on a sole user basis uh, is uh, not commercially feasible. So uh, again, just to sum it all up, uh, we, we, we understand uh, and I appreciate that these are ongoing discussions about how to ensure that more and more people in the educational research uh, community have access to global repository of data, are able to grow capacity and scale in developing uh, and innovating uh, amongst the uh, uh, that in, within that community, and of course, uh, at the root of all of that, the combination of factors uh, between infrastructure and uh, content development on the side of the uh, rent community itself. Uh, thank you. Mr. Ladibu, thank you so much for. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Mr. Wali Abu, are you online? Yes, I'm online. Mr. Abu? Yes. <laughs> you have the floor. You are welcome. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, uh, all. Good morning, panelists and attendees. Um, Really glad to be here and uh, congratulations to uh, Owen and team who were able to pull off very early in the year after what we saw in 2020, you know, uh, a well attended uh, webinar like this. So yes, <clears throat> we're talking about education. It's not, it's not new, it's not uh, unique in the sense that the SDG, I think goal four, talks about quality education, you know? So it's actually a global concern about getting quality education to everybody because we know that education brings out the best in humanity and everyone. Um, even the other goals like goal 10 and 11, of the SDG goals are all kind of related to what we're talking about today. And this uh, quite a number of people are trying to uh, develop to work on these countries are working on it. Uh, Kazim already mentioned the national broadband plan, certain elements about digital inclusion, for example, digital transformation and code, they were all mentioned in the broadband plan. So the country is aware of trying to work on it. Of course, you have the research and education community who's also pushing for their own slice of the cake. Then you have the private sector who is investing, of course, from there. So I'd like to structure my approach to my presentation into, let's say, 
uh, four or five buckets, okay, which is, uh, and maybe I'll step back to first talk about uh, an introduction. Let's just look at where are we in terms of uh, access to the internet, which is basically the first leg of this discussion. Then we can now come down to the topic at hand, which is how do we improve this uh, delivery to the uh, research community and education community to make sure that uh, they have better and uh, affordable access to the internet to drive their objectives are collective objectives of everyone. So if you look at Africa, first and foremost, so we're talking about from an infrastructure or a growth perspective, I think Africa has 520 thousand kilometers of, of fiber, of which 50% of that is in South Africa. You know, Nigeria is second with about 87,000 kilometers of fiber. That's what I hear. Do Kazim says 48. So if you if you and that's one of the issues we have in terms of data points. But between even if you take the higher uh, point, which is I think that 87 includes uh, all kinds of farm uh, microwave, sorry, metro, lease, backbone fiber, all kinds of area fiber. But you still see that compared to South Africa, Nigeria has uh, if you look at the land area of Nigeria, population and economy, it's not a lot of fiber. Then you see, uh, we talk about growth. Africa is, is growing at about 56% uh, CAGR from 2017. It's been growing like that. So growth is coming, uh, I mean, in Africa, driven by, of course, content, devices, and of course the youthful population, and more recently the pandemic, which has uh, driven everybody to uh, accelerate the digital transformation journey. So most people are moving from on-prem to hybrid and even going full cloud now, which means that the demand for data is uh, growing. Nigeria is uh, the, in terms of bandwidth is estimated to get to about uh, 12 terabytes per second in 2023. So this is phenomenal growth. If you now want to locate um, local things, let's now come local and say, okay, how are we going to deliver any service, which is internet? The first block is the infrastructure which uh, I mean, thankfully, uh, uh, my president, uh, Ike Namani of Medallion has already spoken extensively to that, also Kazim. So I won't belabor that point, but between submarine cable, backbone, fiber, towers, and code, there's still an infrastructure gap for everybody in the country. It's not just the uh, research community, and that's why I believe that uh, IHS through Kazim is beginning to deliver additional infrastructure capacity for last mile connectivity, connecting rural areas uh, uh, and all that. That, of course, is going to take some time. But one of the trends is that as the bandwidth increases and as users come, the prices are dropping. Prices are dropping about 26% year on year. So. Uh, from an affordability perspective, even if we don't accelerate anything, it is going to come uh, our way. The other block I would like to talk about quickly is the environment of business. Ultimately, everything we're talking about, even the education community has some business rules that guide them. So we have to look at what kind of policies, you know, are driving our community. So the regulation, for example, from a communication perspective, since around right of way, you know, availability of spectrum, licensing, etc. Then of course, how is the power environment, security, then how safe are investments here? If somebody actually decides to come here and put this investment that connects all these schools, probably drive down the cost and it wants 15, 25 year return. Is the investment safe? Are we 
attracting that kind of uh, thing. Uh, there, there are, I think about, there's a significant, I can't remember the number now of, I think about $18 trillion that is invested in negative yield returns. It tells you that there's money out there is seeking a haven to, to go to. So we need to also, while discussing this thing, situate it within the context of Nigeria and the business environment. If the business environment improves, surely capital will come in here. And when capital comes in here, it will increase infrastructure and of course drive competition and drive down costs. And uh, you see that. Third leg I want to uh, look at is what I'll call the stakeholder uh, consensus and partnership, building that, which um, Echo Connect has done very well, always bringing people from the industry, uh, private sector, to talk to people in academia, and even government. That needs to continue. That collaboration between the private sector, the academia, the government, and even entrepreneurs needs to continue to be watered. It, it will flourish eventually because it's from this collaboration that the understanding will come and definitely the kernel of the, the idea will now be implemented and we uh, probably will come up with a common ground instead of each person trying to do his own thing, a private uh, company just looking for profit entirely, a government coming with only the policies that probably are adverse. And uh, in, in terms of uh, academia, probably having programs that do not talk to either of these uh, legs. Then of course, I'll look at the whole digital transformation, uh, digital inclusion uh, journey. Even when this is there, uh, there are certain practices that need to change, uh, you know, to because digital inclusion, you have to think about access, which is what we're talking about, but there's also the adoption and the application, uh, which is also, uh, huge in terms of this, in today's uh, the, uh, journey. For example, Helium Health uh, just raised $10 million uh, last tail end of last year. To, and what do they do? They just uh, digitize um, medical records. We need more and more people like that. People are still setting up hospitals without having digital records. With, uh, uh, applications these days, you can have all your medical records on the cloud, etc. Where are those kind of initiatives in the education sector? Because we need to start looking at how, how what the world is doing and how people are moving in that direction. So, uh, and of course, when you talk about technology, even fiber uh, now has uh, what they call FSOC, new technology is coming that can drive down the cost of fiber. Because what is really driving up cost of fiber in Nigeria is all the regulation around the right of way charges, the civil work that you have to do, people cutting it, you having to come back and fix it and go. There's some new technology, and this leads me to maybe what Liquid, you know, uh, the company uh, Liquid that I work for, can do to support the education uh, community. Uh, Liquid is, is the largest wholesale open access fiber network uh, entity across Africa today, with over 70,000 uh, kilometers of fiber. Of course, this is going to increase now that we're coming to Nigeria. In Nigeria, we plan to uh, have terrestrial fiber between Nigeria, uh, Lagos, Abuja, uh, Port Harcourt, a protected ring like that. And from here to the West Coast countries through Benin Republic, Togo, and Co. And up into um, Niger Republic. Of course, this will, this will help uh, with the connectivity, especially inland, and bring prices uh, down towards the East when we have uh, correct props there. Second thing is that we're deploying a, a tier three data center right here in Lagos. The construction is going on now to EKS point. There we have to put enough capacity in here. And I'm sure you all know that uh, we have submarine cable from two of the uh, hyperscalers coming into Nigeria in the next couple of years. Liquid is uh, participating in that from an investment 
and execution standpoint. So we're positioned to help grow the digital economy in Nigeria. As in, in South Africa, for example, 40,000 schools are connected to liquid fiber. And it was a very easy thing. Everywhere the fiber is, there's a mapping that's done. You find out how close are the institutions. And I think uh, that's one of the things I'll be asking Owen if they have that kind of information to provide for us. Where are the institutions? Can we map them basically, even a simple Google Earth map to see how proximate are they to any fiber location? Then have a holistic plan, as uh, Kazim mentioned, to even quantify what it will take, how much more effort in terms of investment, in terms of actual digging and all that to get the connectivity to the last mile. You may find out that in some cases, the fiber is passing right in front of the school and, uh, you know, but nobody's even uh, tracking that. So liquid, we're very interested in, in, in supporting uh, uh, the rain in Nigeria. I think in other in East Africa, uh, we we actually work very well with the rain, and we tend to do that in Nigeria, West Africa, to leverage on the global and African footprint of uh, liquid. I think I'll uh, stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abu. Very. Very interesting uh, presentation there. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and your experience too. Now let's go into the round table discussion. Like I said earlier, the format will be Q and A, and then uh, blended with uh, comments and obs observations. So if you have uh, questions, please post your questions on the chat box so that uh, you all can see the questions and then you can form the basis for discussion among the panelists. Uh, uh, if you if you want to make a comment, just raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. Uh, we'll uh, call you, and then uh, you can make your comment. Mister, you are. You'll uh, help us coordinate this. Right. I can see Yes, I can see a hand raised by uh, a hand raised, yes, Aruna Jimo. I'm going to allow him to talk. So, Haruna, would you like to um, ask your question? Please, uh, for, for contributors, uh, before you asking your question or making your comment, please introduce yourself, give us your affiliation. And then you can go on to make to ask your question. Thank you. Yes, uh you see you are. Who has the floor? Um Haruna Jimo. Okay. Miss Haruna Jimo, please you have the floor. Unmute yourself if uh, your mic is muted. All right, we seem to be having a, 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 a challenge with Haruna. So okay. um, I can see Ayodele Alonge. If you unmute your mic, you can ask your question. Are you daily? Okay, thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here. Uh, Alunge, please. Okay, yes, my name is yes, Ayo Adelia Alunge. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And uh, to congratulate the organizers for putting this program together. 
And I must say that uh, this program has come at the very right time, very good time. You know, when, for example, in my university, uh, the school has resumed, but we need to work uh, virtually to teach our students online. And I must tell you that uh, there's a kind of gap, a kind of training gap all over, not only in your every, I mean, in all schools around Nigeria. So I want to ask, what is the step? Or what is the collaboration or what is the, uh, the plan of EcoConnect Eco and all other people that have spoken uh, to work with the university to achieve the virtual learning uh, plan? So that is my question. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Alunga. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's a general question, really. That, that question applies to many public uh, institutions, many. Well, I know the, the private institutions don't joke with their infrastructure. But for many public institutions, infrastructure remains uh, a very, very big uh, issue for, for a number of reasons. So can we take uh, the next, please, uh, our panelists just simply note uh, the question and then I will aggregate Give it about three to five questions, and then of course we can give you the floor. Okay, there's, um, uh, I think Dr. Chinwei wishes to uh, speak. Okay, oh. Dr. Chinwei, okay. Dr. Chinwei, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, make your comment. Dr. Chinwe, you need to um, unmute your microphone. Oh, we've lost her. Okay. Um, okay. Let's move on to the next one. Next person is um, Okim Alobi Oyama. Okay. Good afternoon. Good, Sorry. Good yeah. morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, yeah. My name is Okim Alubi Oyama. I work with Pan-African Tours. And my question is regarding cloud computing. Uh, we saw the impact of COVID-19 on education here in Nigeria, and a lot of public schools were affected. Uh, what's the hope for schools in uh, rural communities if schools in, public, in, in the urban areas, especially public schools, were affected? I'm talking in respect to all this cloud computing and then the fact that um, schools hardly have uh, data repositories. So what's the plan to ensure that these issues are resolved? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yama, thank you. Can we take one more question, one more comment? Um, Ehije Enato has um, a hand raised. Ehije? Yeah. Um... Uh, prof. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, how are you? You're very fine, Prof. Good to see you uh, here. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm uh, Professor Enato from University of Benin, uh, Faculty of Pharmacy, also the Director of uh, Standard Leakages. Um, yeah, so the issue of, uh, you know, remote learning, you know, has become a reality in the um, world all over, you know, as a result of the COVID-19. And uh, there's a lot of challenges as well to many institutions, uh, tertiary, secondary, and even the primary across the board. But the question is, where do we go from here? Because uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, when you go to conferences, especially in the Africa, they tell you about the digital, digital divide between the North and South. So right now, that divide is uh, it's like ocean. So I, I really don't know where we're going to start from. I think uh, this group can begin to think of very small projects, small projects that are implementable, um, which um, you can bring uh, like minds together and begin to see how we can, uh, based on our, our own understanding of our environment, how we can be able to help to begin to solve this problem in very little way. Otherwise, 
it's really going to be very catastrophic because uh, I don't see COVID-19 leaving uh, very soon and it's very likely to stay with us. You know, I, I was also in the webinar yesterday. I belong to an international consortium. And we have speakers around the different uh, parts of the world. And one of the speakers, one of the uh, members of the consortium is a South African who was also raising the same issue. That this is another pandemic. Um, you have HIV AIDS, uh, which didn't sh uh, did not shut down the world as we now have with COVID-19. And Africa is going to be badly affected. It's already been badly affected. So I think we should begin to think of very small implementable projects, meet with some schools or unions within schools that may be willing to adopt some of these solutions and begin to see how we can begin to resolve all of this. So that's just my little contributions for now. Well, so EJ Nato, thank mm -hmm. you so much for your contribution. Thank you. Already badly affected. <laughs> in Nigeria, we're already badly affected. Yes. Big universities have not gone to school mm -hmm. since March last year. Yeah. That's, that's catastrophic. Yeah. Can we take one more comment? Then we will revert to the panelists. I think we have um, Omar Owaya has his hand raised. OK, Omar. Good morning, everyone. You have uh, the floor, please. Yes, I hope you can hear me. It's uh, Omo Owaya from Wakren. I'm so, sure there uh, will be more of comments, contributions than uh, questions. Well, it is in, the, in this case, you know, it is uh, a combination of all. <laughs> okay. So uh, listening to uh, Professor Inato, you know, uh, small implement implementable projects, I, there's no doubt that we need to do that, but the, the, there is the challenge that I think some of the speakers alluded to about you know, how we sort of um, reach scale. So we've got, a, we've got a real challenging infrastructural situation. So yes, there's growth, like uh, Mr. L Mr. Ladipo said, but there's the there's humongous challenge as well. Now, the whole idea of research education networks, you know, like a co-connect engineering and on the regional sort of basis, Wakren, is to, is to bring the primary stakeholders together to do pretty much what we are doing here, to find ways in which we solve our communal problems and uh, use, that, use the insight, the understanding of our needs to design these solutions. So I've had, uh, I, I actually liked the, uh, the remark by um, Kazim about, you know, maybe we should focus this discussion on how we can sort of bring these different elements together. Uh, Echo Connect calls it co-petition. It means, you know, we want, we know these businesses have to earn money like uh, Mr. Namani said, but we think you know, uh, and it's been demonstrated in other regions that the, these different commercial, government, private sector, and even citizen interests can be brought together under some coherent and viable approach to scaling. So if, if Liquid Telecom uh, is going to be putting fiber from Abuja to Lagos to Port Harcourt in a redundant ring and connecting it to the region, uh, which I have noted because we, we need the fiber connecting our different countries. And um, IHS, I forget the name of the uh, subsidiary, I think Kazim will tell us later, that is, is, is also interconnecting towers in Nigeria with fiber. And then Medallion is building data centers, you know, Liquid is also building data centers. How do we, how do we sort of find a way in all this interest to say, right, um, you are building this. Where are you building this? Uh, Wally had the example of uh, in South Africa, we have 40,000 schools were connected because the company identified where, which schools were close to where it was laying its fiber. And first of, first of all, 
uh, which is, I think has come across you know, in all the conversations that we all recognize the importance of education and research. We know it's a public good. We know that without it, uh, we have no chance of actually furthering national development. So that is not an excuse. We, we understand that. So that on one part, I would like us to discuss that a lot more. Maybe in their responses, the speakers can actually speak to that basic question, which is how do we take our different strategies that we have, you know, our commercial strategies and find ways to collaborate so that we align some part of that to support education and research in the country. Nobody's asking for freebies. We want to, we want to, we just want it to be affordable. And we know that for it to be affordable, it means the businesses have to make money. So if the businesses have to make money, and like I pointed out, you know, you want, you know, revenue that can work. What do we need as the education community to be to, to, to make that happen for you? We can tell you what we need. We, you know the budgets we don't have, but like Wale also mentioned, we know there's money in the system because whatever it is, we pay for it now. Can we sort of together find a new path that says, you know, we're going to lay fiber from uh, Lagos to Port Harcourt. This is the path of our fiber. Now, as the com education community, what do you have here? You know, how much, how, how long can you commit to our uh, rollout strategy? How much money or what can you do here? Who else can we extend this to so that we can even make it more affordable? Some of the work we're doing in Wakren and which has also happened in Nigeria is, uh, is, the, is, is the work we do under the Lipsense Initiative, which is uh, looking to build the information capability of uh, librarians and working in conjunction with the research networks to sort of provide support for open science in their local communities. So that sort of addresses some of the questions uh, that I've heard about data repositories and content, because there's also a challenge there. But that's not the only area of the education community that's a challenge. So Prof, this is where I suppose uh, you might be able to speak to both of you or the ones, the people on the, in the panel, uh, Professor Natra as well. What is the uh, community's leadership in terms of, I'm talking about research education community, I'm talking vice chancellors, uh, deans of faculties. How do you see resolving this problem that Ayadele Alonge spoke about? It is clear that you can't do it individually, just like the companies, the corporate sector cannot do this by themselves. What is the, what is the plan? Can we discuss a little bit more of that? Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Amo. Uh, panelists, can we revert to you? And then uh, from what I gathered, what I've gathered so far, there'll be need for a conversation between um, administrators in uh, public institutions in particular. And then of course, uh, service uh, providers. But I do know that that has been going on for quite some time. Uh, even before NGRN, before NGRN started deploying uh, its uh, network, we've been having that, that conversation and I, I, I think it seems to be an ongoing one. But currently, well, what I, I really can see is that some institutions are just simply handicapped in terms of availability of funds to be able to do some of these things we've uh, talked about. And I think uh, Engineer Namani actually put it very, very, very clearly. How do we balance between providing quality services and then of course the issue of uh, affordability? So I, I think that also, that, re, uh, that also remains a, a critical issue. The public institutions are not 
well-funded. I think that's already understood. You already know that. And that explains why the universities have been on, on, on strike for, the, for, 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 for about nine months. So where do we go from here? So funding is a very, very key issue. And the, the conversation between service providers and the institutions will need to address that. So panelists, can we, can we listen to you? Uh, Engineer Namani. Um, Prof, so just before even um, the panelists um, um, make their contributions, uh, I, I'd just like to make a, a, a quick comment because uh, one of the one of the questions was um, directed um, particularly at Echo Connect. Echo Connect, okay. Uh, in terms of what um, Echo Connect is doing to uh, address this, um, this 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 challenge. So before I, I let the panelists really um, make their contributions, I, I'd like to say that um, obviously last year, uh, you know, when particularly when the, the whole country went into lockdown, everything just came to a standstill. The COVID really just highlighted the lack of um, infrastructure uh, as has been mentioned in different ways in high, higher education in, in particular. Our response uh, from an Eco Connect perspective has been to build a lot of uh, services, uh, their cloud related services um, that would um, engender or promote collaboration and uh, learning and uh, other types of services in terms of uh, academic identity. So, in pretty much in 2020, Echo Connect has been building these infrastructure uh, cloud services that can be uh, hopefully shared among the, the education sector. Obviously, the, these services uh, will rely on the good uh, connectivity infrastructure to be useful for institutions. But yes, we do have infrastructure that has been developed in the cloud that hopefully um, universities will, will will subscribe to and i think these will be discussed in other sessions during the conference Good. thank you mr you for that uh, explanation engineer namani yeah um thank you uh once more and uh good uh presentations and the uh, contributions so far I think I want to just address two of the uh, comments because they're actually uh, similar. The one from uh, Prof. Ayodele and uh, also Prof. Uh, Ehije in terms of um, remote learning uh, because uh, it's not obvious that we, COVID, as we've all said, have introduced a, a new way of life. And I was having conversation with some people just uh, two days ago in terms of workforce that even post uh, COVID, work will not be the same anymore. People have realized that uh, even uh, depending on the nature of your business, if your staff can work remotely, they're actually more efficient, especially those that work within Lagos, where you spend uh, a quarter of your day in traffic people are beginning to understand that by adventure, COVID may end up being a blessing in disguise for uh, ability to rejig um, your, your work process. So this is something that has come to stay. Um, I happens to be involved uh, in under a separate platform uh, with Delta State, where I have a contract to roll out smart city services across the state. And one of them happens to be in the education sector. So we've been working with all the state-owned higher institution within Delta State for like a year now, rolling out uh, education management solutions and other stuff, right? And it has given me first-hand knowledge of practical challenge that these institutions are facing. The first thing that everybody says is, oh, we need Wi-Fi, we need Wi-Fi, we need Wi-Fi, come roll out Wi-Fi as part of the smart city project. And by the time we do it 
a cost analysis of what it would take to roll out the Wi-Fi and what they are ready to pay for it. There was a big disconnect. It, it didn't work economically to, to do that investment. And we needed to sit down and have a honest conversation about it because the first thing they had said is that, oh, they want to pay an uh, average of about 500 Naira uh, per student for, for, for Wi-Fi service, for broadband service. And the numbers just didn't work. It's, it's a matter of being realistic. The numbers just mm -hmm. did not work. So uh, mm -hmm. we had to go back uh, to the drawing board to say, no, no, no. Yes, this is your wish list, but guess what? This is what is, you know, this is what the numbers are, are like. Let's be realistic. Um, the second thing which we found out, which, and I'm throwing all this out there because it may help some of us, is the schools, we are trying to do this as we are taking the service as the school. So this is our budget. This is what we can afford. This is what comes in from the, the, the government. And we realize that these are services that should be looked more from the student perspective, not the school. Because guess what? The school may not be able to afford uh, rolling out Wi-Fi service for within the school, but the students may be able to afford it. Because guess what? Some of them are probably spending much more than that buying data on their phones anyways, you, you know? So, so, so we needed to rethink the approach in terms of who pays for the services, because what you'll find out is that just by looking at it from that standpoint, who pays for the service, a lot of this service may actually be able to be rolled out that than if it's been approved from what can the institution as an organization afford based on its budget and what uh, it cannot do. So that is food for talk for other schools to also look at. We are in terms of trying to monetize the service, you, you may need to look at it from the student facing standpoint than from the institution being the provider of the resource. Because as we all know, and most of us in the institutions know, there's no money from uh, directly coming to the schools, except we also do what uh, I gave the example of, which is where the schools start looking at other ways to participate with the private sector under some partnership to generate revenue that will take care of some of this infrastructure beyond what comes from annual budget to the schools. The, the other part, which is very interesting because we also noticed it in uh, what we are doing in data state. Uh, they said, everybody says, oh, we need remote learning. We need online learning and the rest. And we noticed also there was a disconnect between what, um, the professors or lecturers are used to, you know, um, uh, and what is not required to be done, uh, which is setting up a digital classroom where students can participate irrespective of where they are, you, you know, and the ability of the lecturer to digitize their content and offer it within a digital environment. So we also notice a disconnect uh, with that. In, in terms of the platforms to do this. Even what we are using now for this call, uh, for this section, Zoom, can be used as uh, an education tool if uh, the proper um, uh, class structure is set up within Zoom, right? So there are different, and there are, beyond Zoom, there are so many other ones that can be used. So there's not as much a challenge with the technology to make it happen versus the ability of the community to actually adapt uh, and reject the traditional learning environment to be able to uh, make this happen. The students can always, as long as they've got data wherever they are, they can always join. So, so those are some of the areas I figured that, uh, because I'm, we are getting a lot of uh, questions in terms of how do people go remote, distance learning and the rest is, from my experience, it's not as much challenge as not having um, the platforms to use versus now, you know, rejigging the whole education curriculum uh, and the channel under which uh, professors and lecturers are used to in delivering um, lectures. Then if you do that, then all you have to now confront is either the capacity within the school environment or 
the lecturer environment if he wants to provide his lectures even sitting in the comfort of his home? How much capacity does he have in terms of uh, sufficient bandwidth to, to log in and, and provide the lectures as well as what the various students uh, would be able to, to have access to irrespective of where they are sitting? Uh, unfortunately, we can't control much of that because it depends on where each person is at any point in time and the kind of bandwidth that is available to them. But at least for majority um, of, of the people, that, that will definitely go a long way. So um, I subscribe to the fact that uh, there are still challenges, but uh, we are much, much closer to solving some of these challenges than we probably know. And I believe, as I said, I've followed EcoConnect and the University Research Network for a while. And I think we're on the right path. It's just that more work needs to be done, but we are definitely on the right path. Engineer Namani, that's quite wonderful of you. Thank you so much. I think it's a new day, really, in, um, in our schools, in our institutions. The chips are down, really. Um, yes, yeah, schools have reopened, but they can't reopen physically. So uh, uh, everybody is coming to terms with what needs to be done. I mean, you just have to engage. And as I speak to you, in my university, meetings are being held. They are not physical meetings. Uh, trainings are going on. They are not physical trainings. On the LMS and, and things which uh, many professors have uh, discountenanced over the years. So indeed the chips are down. Uh, how soon we can really make this the new normal is what nobody can predict, but uh, I think we thank God for COVID, unfortunately. <laughs> but, 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 but I think that's where we are now. And I, and I hope if uh, that could, uh, if we can scale that across the institutions. I think that would be good news for the country. Mr. Engineer Ladipo, your comments. You know, I, I usually uh, get to appropriate engineering, <laughs> engineering qualifications to <laughs> <laughs> I am not. I am not an engineer by training, so I would. I would. Oh. I wouldn't think. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> an attorney with a lot of IT, twenty uh, years of IT experience. But um, I, I think. Thank you, Prof. I think that and I haven't heard everybody talk about this. What? Uh, and I, I did hear more uh, very incisively talk about trying to identify and aggregate the requirement. Uh, and bring it forward. The, for private uh, institutions uh, or entities who are in the business of providing this infrastructure, we're supporting them uh, to get as many people as uh, required. Uh, the, the motivation at the core of it is always the, you know, the investment opportunity for return. But I think uh, a lot of these institutions over the years have also come to terms with the reality that when it comes to education, uh, the, the priority doesn't necessarily become uh, making as much money uh, as possible out of it, but uh, growing that um, demand market where you can build a sustainable platform that can at least cater for its own requirement over a period of time. So uh, while it is not totally CSR, uh, it is seen as developmental uh, and the tendencies are to view it as something that you need to nurture to grow. So uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at it from that standpoint, then you, you start to um, think about how to address uh, that deficit, if the deficit exists. Now, uh, as it is today with the pandemic and the way that we've all gone virtual uh, uh, in terms of um, delivery of services, not necessarily just rain services, but the services that affect our lives uh, today, uh, the platform has generally been the wireless uh, 
technology uh, medium where we all have phones, uh, we can access the internet on this phone. Uh, so I would assume that for most of the people that we are trying to target on the user side, the students, they must have some uh, degree of connectivity services today. I bet the challenge in that sphere of uh, the service delivery would be the quality of those services on one side. I, I, I stand to be corrected. At least they do have some access. Same for the people that are in rural area where the services are still 2G and they're not very efficient on their epileptic. But at least in the very uh, urban or semi-urban uh, communities, there's some sort of access to internet services of wireless networks. Uh, but that at least addresses a bit of the challenge on the user side. On the side of the institutions themselves, uh, I think we all need to sort of identify what the challenge is. Is a challenge or are the challenges uh, the ability to create the platform for this knowledge sharing or gathering research materials? Uh, are those challenges connecting multiple platforms within a community? one community or connecting multiple platforms in one community to another community. Uh, we need to specifically define what these challenges are. When they are defined and infrastructure providers get a sense of what the challenges are, then we start to build solutions uh, or take a solution approach to dealing with them. Uh, at the level that we are today, there are some degree of infrastructure, uh, at least connecting multiple networks in Nigeria. Uh, what I'm trying to do, or what we're trying to do at GICN is first connect all the base stations because most users are on the wireless networks. As you build that, you're building opportunities for more capillaries to go into other places because you're not, these fiber networks are contiguous, so they pass through locations or localities you can tear off from them and start to build into uh, non-base station type communities, which ultimately includes the educational institutions. Uh, I was in Ibadan a few weeks back talking to the, uh, the university community. I think I did hear one of the professors uh, ask a question and make a comment in the course of this uh, uh, engagement. Uh, and we will be connecting a few uh, sites you are. In fact, we had to go meet the university uh, organization to say we're building in your school where we will connect XYZ locations uh, to give us an approval to uh, right of way to build that infrastructure. Uh, we're building multiple cores of fiber. Uh, why would we not uh, be in a position to at least tear off some of this uh, fiber to certain locations where the school has a requirement, uh, where we can then help them to start to densify or build more capillarities within the campus itself, uh, their own fiber networks to connect those platforms that have been built or to at least give them a, uh, some basis or foundation for building those platforms, knowing fully well that they can be connected to reach the educational communities within the colleges. Now, those can then be connected on the back of those networks to other communities where uh, the interconnection is required. But again, it, it starts from understanding that this is what the university is looking at doing. These are the plans that the institutions have put together. This is where the deficit in terms of infrastructure, sometimes even funding in terms of getting content, even in terms of creating the right awareness that facilitates the inclusion of international parties that may readily want to participate in such projects with the universities uh, connected and brought into the, uh, to, to that conversation so that it's robust enough and things are moving uh, very quickly. So uh, from, from the way that I look at it, uh, each, institution or organization, each of the stakeholders, they need to come together and say, these are the challenges. 
uh, that we're facing. And then let's put them together uh, and start to address them. The best way to address this is building shared platforms. It's the only way to go. Uh, and, and the people who will do it, some of them are on this call, some are not here. But they see the incentive to do it because when you do it, you grow the base. Once you grow the base, the business ultimately becomes uh, viable and it can be sustainable. So those are my contributions in this regard. Thank you so much, uh, Saladiko. Thank you for sharing your wealth of experiences. Sawaliabu. There were a couple of hands also raised while uh, uh, there were some responses. So okay. while Wale is making his contributions, if uh, those people want to raise their hands again, uh, quite possibly, maybe uh, Mr. Ahmed, we if you want to just quickly throw in your question um, before Wale speaks. So we, we, we just have that in the bank as well. And there's something on the chat box too. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator uh, and the panelists. Uh, I, hope, I hope you can hear me, Professor. Uh, Ahmed. Um, this is Ahmed. Good to Mr. see you. Hello, sir. Mr. Shafi. Yeah, good to see you too. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes. Then, please, um, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm joining you from uh, Osman Nafodi University, Sokoto. Actually, we started the, this thing together, but uh, somehow I got network challenges and uh, I only rejoined at the point when the Professor Owadia was talking about the coronavirus, which is unfortunately been a fortunate uh, development because it leads to a lot of uh, you know, uh, interest in e-learning. Uh, actually, here at uh, this part of the country, uh, we we looked at the possibility of coming over a, 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 a community-based network, which we call SOCREN. I'm sure Pro is aware of it. Owen also is aware. Omo, if he's around, is also aware of it. Unfortunately, we faced some challenges somehow. And since then, it has become comatose. But uh, right now, we are working hard to introduce it. We are looking at how we bring all the tertiary institutions together and uh, be able to share resources and connect to other networks like Echo Connect uh, and uh, see how we can leverage on whatever we have to really improve on uh, teaching, research, and learning. But that is, by the way, the, what I really want to talk about or ask a question actually is uh, with respect to the e-learning uh, process. At the Usman Nampodi University, there was a Senate meeting yesterday and uh, it was unanimously approved that the e-learning should uh, take off formally. Of course, we have been doing so many things here and there. But one of the challenges uh, I foresee with this is uh, really access by students beyond the campus. Within the campus, we have fiber, we have wireless, we have uh, uh, you know some appreciable level of uh, bandwidth. But by the time the students that are in their respective houses wish to really connect to this network, it means they have to use data. And uh, using their own data, as we know, data is really expensive as it is now. So as we work towards bringing all the tertiary institutions together and looking at how e-learning can be facilitated in this part of the country, I'm really throwing this to the experts. How can we really be able to bring the cost of data to the lowest minimum so that our students here can now be able to access uh, all these resources you know, at uh, a minimum cost, because that is really very, very important if we really want to carry these students along. Bring, putting up a learning management system with all the data, with all the content in there in the cloud, or whether it is going to be locally in a typical uh, campus data center will still require the data if they are coming from outside. Within the campus, yes, you can now be able to do all these things. So I, I'm really looking at what, kind of strategies can we really adopt if we really wish to have this data at a lower cost? And uh, because somebody talked about the network operators looking at how do they generate revenue beyond the school when the school is no longer in session. We hope learning will continue even when the students are back in their uh, houses, but data is a problem. Please, that is my, my, my question. I'm sorry if this has been discussed earlier while I was away, but I really want to 
Thank you, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Good, good, to, good to see you again. It's been Hi, quite a time. Hi, Ahmed. Even before they respond, uh, Mr. Abu, before you comment, uh, yeah, there have been uh, concerns about the fact that uh, Nigeria has so much uh, uh, upstream bandwidth provision in terms of fiber landing on uh, our shores in Lagos, uh, maybe Portacourt and so on. So much. And yet, we are complaining about capacity. The person in Sokoto is complaining about capacity. The person in uh, Enugu is complaining about capacity. Yet we have so much capacity in Lagos. What, what exactly, what are the challenges of delivering this capacity, moving the capacity from Lagos to other parts of the country? Mr. Abu. Okay, thank you. Uh, directly, the, it has to do with the environment of uh, business because you are now talking of last mile, you are now talking of metro fiber, you are now talking of interstate, then you'll be talking about right of way, like I mentioned before. And of course, the security of your distributed infrastructure, if you are using microwave uh, for the tower companies, for example, then you'll be talking about the cost of power you know, when you have distributed infrastructure and there's no power, you have to put generators there, the capex involved and all that. Then you'll be talking about the maintenance, the expertise. So, of course, it now becomes a huge challenge. The people who are bringing in a submarine cable, if you look at their scale, the competencies they have, their access to capital, they bring it. And that's why most of them don't want to go beyond you know, the shore of Nigeria. They drop it there, then you deal with your internal issues. And that's where, you know, companies like Liquid um, and Co, who are coming in here to try and do terrestrial fiber to take the capacity in from the data centers, from the landing stations, to places like Portaco, to places like Enugu, Ilori, and even further up north to Sokoto and Co. Uh, are welcome. And this is where I say, you know, it's a, it's a big discussion, of course, governments will be involved to make sure that you make the environment friendly for people who have indicated interest to actually sit down here and do good business. And of course, these are long-term things. You can't uh, recover your money in one day. So people always look at the long-term viability. And the first thing you do is, of course, is your country analysis. So, but let's pack that and come down to some of the other things I picked up in terms of uh, what Omar mentioned. I think if we if we say, okay, what exactly, how do we home in on? How do we take this whole big project? It's like an elephant. You know, if you look at uh, digital inclusion, you know, as uh, it is, it, we're just talking about the access part now. You are just talking about, okay, deploying the infrastructure. Somebody already mentioned skill. I think you mentioned skill. Even where you have the infrastructure, what is the adoption like? Are they able to use it? What applications are they running on those infrastructure? Are you just going to Facebook? You know, what's internet traffic today where they won't have it in Lagos? Are they using it to learn? So there's also that part. So we have to look at the whole thing holistically. And I think the most uh, useful thing is to find a case, uh, a case study, build a business case and, and try and create a success story. And I think uh, uh, we try to collaborate with uh, Namdi and Ikiwe University, uh, in, in, in the East and with the Parkland Hospital and all that, we try to create a cluster, I think to create a success story in the East. I really don't know how uh, that has gone, but I think 
taking projects that will demonstrate the power of this collaboration of a community network. You find a place like Enugu. Enugu's got about four universities, okay? A place like Kaduna also has about four or five higher education places. You have health. So the community of education goes beyond the library. You know, the library is actually the internet. What we're talking about is access to that internet. So it's not just in the student hostel, it's not just in the faculty building, but in those little places around, around it. If you live in any university community, you know that the, the staff, the non-academic staff and the professors and co, they are there all year round. They have a community of their own. And there are many businesses that are set up around the university. So yes, while the student population may shift left and right, if you come up with an innovative business case, that gives them access and usage all the time, even when they are not there, like the last speaker said. If you are outside that geographical boundary of the university, do you still have access? There are many, many universities cannot host everybody, cannot accommodate everybody on campus. So people stay around. So in designing uh, access, for example, on, uh, on that, I think the university needs to look beyond thinking as an enterprise. I think uh, uh, Ike mentioned it. You are not an enterprise that you want to pay the whole bills. If you create a distributed uh, ownership structure where even the, com the fact that you are there, there are businesses around there who also need this for their business. You, need, you have the students who are living far away from campus. If that can be designed and cracked in one location, then it's a matter of replicating it elsewhere. And this is what uh, I think I mentioned before that in the uh, bucket I talked about, about stakeholder consensus and partnerships. We have to be able to, to crack that uh, in a particular geography. Take a place like in the East, take a particular place, not very big and complex. We've received requests from Enugu where people want uh, to, they wonder oh, how can we improve connectivity here. This is the health sector complaining, you know. The, so once you have capacity in there, it's going to serve government, it's going to serve health, it's going to serve businesses. Of course, it will serve the citizens and co. But I think cracking it, we're trying to crack a very big problem, you know, and I mean, uh, you can't stuff an elephant in your mouth. As the Indians say, if you want to eat an elephant, you eat it one bit, one bite at a time. We need to slice, I think what's my own suggestion is, uh, we need to make sure that projects such as uh, those community connectivity projects that we're trying to do in certain places, we make sure we project manage them and see it through to the end by uh, start seeing the benefits. When, I mean, Nigeria is a very uh, dynamic place. When something works in a place, in one place, it's very easy to replicate. If it's uh, Usman Danfodio University, as, uh, uh, if it's that environment, there must be applications for both the education community and the community around it. If we are able to crack that, then you just start replicating across the way. And for uh, companies like us, we, we know that usage will grow our business. So it's also, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer that the more people you are able to connect, the more applications they are able to run, you know, the more they adopt uh, digital tools to run their business, to study for entertainment and all that, that upload content, and the better for us. So we are willing to collaborate with anybody, you know, to make sure that we, we bring uh, life, you know, I'll call it life, call internet, uh, if you, there's this very lovely data is life advert that mm -hmm. the ETA has one. It always resonates with me when I see uh, data <laughs> is life. I mean, we are here today. If you if you are not uh, uh, if you have no internet today, I, I just imagine how we actually live, you know, and and we we who know what the internet can do, and we are not declaring a state of emergency. You know, in the education and health sector, uh, with respect to putting, uh, you know, connectivity there. So there's that. Oh, there's also that 
need for, uh, you know, the government, let me say the will. They are doing a lot of this in pockets. Delta State will do something, NCC will do something, CBN will do something. There needs to, it, it is terrible. A year, children are not in school. COVID exposed our healthcare for, uh, inadequacies. You know, capacity is sitting in Lagos. To take it inside, people are telling you you can't pass, you come and build right away. A few governors have now waived it because they have now realized that you know what, you are doing yourself a disservice by not allowing uh, telecom infrastructure uh, coming. But we need more of that. It's a good beginning, but we need to put pile pressure on our representatives, on uh, opinion leaders, and people can actually do something. And set a solid timeline. The broadband plan must be implemented to the letter, you know, so that uh, people can have uh, access to, to the internet. Once you have the access, then you can now start learning in the, the most uh, uh, common phrase in the last 12 months was uh, unmute yourself. You are on mute. You are on mute. <laughs> you know, everybody has suddenly uh, learned how to unmute and mute themselves because we, we were catapulted into the digital world, whether we liked it or not. Uh, so final, while if somebody asked about the skills, you know, teachers, what are we doing about it? I think it was a general question at the beginning of the, uh, you know, because yes, I mean, I have, <laughs> I have uh, interactions with some people who are teachers, who are in the education community, but the skills they have, everybody has been talking about the future of work, you know, that digital skill, digital literacy is the way to the future. We need to also start upskilling these uh, teachers. You can't have, people who have been using the chalk and blackboard for the past 30 years, suddenly migrating to screens and you expect delivery. So it's not just about putting the screen and putting the internet bandwidth. We also have to now have the human capacity because the teaching, the teacher is a person, is not a, is not a rack, you know, is not a server. That's the software in that human being is not something you can just load and delete. We need to also take a good look at that because it, we may that may be a big blind spot also. And I think the education community needs to declare a state of emergency in that uh, area. I see a lot of people in that community who, who lack this skill and are unable to actually de deliver uh, what a generation uh, that is an internet generation right, is able to do. And it's easy for you to see if you look at the way um, content is delivered, educational content is delivered, if you are taking the learning from a foreign institution and you're taking it from a local institution, you can see that, yes, it's the same internet, it's the same uh, base infrastructure, but there are certain things that are still uh, missing. So back to my uh, core point, let's use this conference to identify one or two locations and uh, maybe Udus or Esud and take it from there or Namde Azikiwe University as the academic anchor tenant. And we look at the community and uh, pull in the partners. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure listening to you, Wally. Thank you so much. Eh? I think we, we should be rounding up. In fact, we are actually rounding up. I would uh, call, uh, I will call Kazim to talk to us briefly. Kazim, I, I'm sure this should be your last comment here. We we'll just have a few minutes, Prof. We're actually running out of time. Yes. Sir. All right. Uh, thank you, Prof. I think- Sir, uh, I, I wanted you to talk about rural connectivity. Just okay. a, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think that there's an alignment of uh, intention right there because I was going to address the concerns raised by the professor from Uthman uh, Danfodio. I, I think part of what uh, uh, we're doing at GICL uh, at the moment is finding the right solutions for uh, locations that are outside of core coverage for our wireless networks today uh, and building rural 
uh, footprint, rural telephony footprint uh, across the country. This this has started already. So, uh, and when we say rural, we're looking at communities with you know 500 to 6,000 uh, type uh, dwellers, uh, where we can install very light uh, equipment, uh, you know, with very light footprint, uh, with very low power requirement. As this uh, Equipments get more power uh, efficient and provide coverage uh, to those communities and connect them to uh, the mobile networks uh, uh, infrastructure. That's already been done. We've done a couple of sites. In fact, the sites that we've done are actually in northern Nigeria, and we will do uh, upward of 1,000 to 2,000 of those sites uh, within the next uh, 12 to 24 months. So that would, to an extent, help to address some of the challenges that. Uh, people that are outside of campus or core network coverage areas are experiencing. I think to, to round up generally, Wally did provide insight into some of the questions that you asked, uh, Prof. Um, I keep saying it, the solution to these problems are highly ingrained in collective efforts, shared uh, networks. That's, that's, that's the way out. It's either you're sharing, you're aggregating the need and sharing it. So we're not duplicating the infrastructure and increasing costs. Uh, this infrastructure costs a lot of money, uh, and most of the time, each one of us is building over capacity. If we aggregate them uh, and we look at the institutions uh, and they all aggregate their needs, we can plan more efficiently uh, and we can deliver services at more affordable uh, price point on the infrastructure cost side so that the schools, uh, the research and educational network community could have a cheaper access to network and we can sustain that. Uh, over a long period of time. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Kazim. Uh, Omo, quickly. You wanted to respond to Amish Shafir's uh, comments? Omo. Okay. Uh, if Omo is on if it's not online, I will just give uh, Engineer Namani just said last, last, your last comment, please. Yeah, thanks, um, everybody. As we've said, uh, we are more than uh, ready to um, support uh, the evolving uh, uh, research and education network. And uh, on all aspects of it, we'll keep doing what we can uh, across the various verticals to ensure that uh, these things work out. So we'll continue to engage with uh, Omar, Owen, and their team and see what we can do together. But it's been nice uh, talking to you guys. Well, I have a voice now, Prof. They are, they are taking Omar, my voice. Omar, please, just quickly, we are, we are out of time already. All right, no, it's okay. I think I've already responded in text anyway. My, the point I was going to make is that uh, if the if the research and education community coherently can come to use the cloud and identify some platforms where they sort of do their business, then it is possible to discuss with the telecoms providers in such a way that uh, connectivity to those locations can be zero rated so that students don't have to use their data uh, to connect to them. Just like they probably do already with some, they, you know, in Nigeria, for instance, if you use the Opera browser or if you go to some Facebook sites, you can do that without data. Similar stuff. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, uh, Omo. Thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've, uh, we've come to the end of this uh, session. Um, so much, so much to chew, really. <laughs> we've uh, identified quite a number of things. Uh, based on the presentations and the discussions so far. Uh, just like Omar said a while ago, coherent needs assessment by R and E. That seems to be very, very important and fundamental. And then when this is done, there is need for aggregation. We need to aggregate this. Uh, and having done that, there is need for 
community connectivity. So that that makes uh, it worthwhile for service providers. So the, the service providers actually will need to engage with R and E to be able to make this uh, happen. Uh, yes, the institutions are currently under pressure to do this, but it's also very important for the service providers to engage. And then of course, uh, eventually have uh, meaningful collaboration if we are really going to be able to deliver this. I think this, they seem to be the, they seem to be the, the key things, key deliverables from uh, this, uh, this session. I think we'll properly document this and uh, put this uh, up uh, for people to see, participants to see as a takeaway from uh, the, the session. Uh, I want to thank on your behalf uh, the session speakers. Engineer Ike Chukun Namani, CEO of Medallion Communications and the President Adcon. Kazim Ladipo, VP IHS Nigeria Limited. And the Wali Abu, CEO Liquid Telecoms. Uh, gentlemen, you've been very fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of uh, experience with us. And then uh, the members of the audience, the participants, thank you all too for your contributions and for making this uh, session lively and worthy uh, while. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waya, sorry, Mr. Yoha. Mr. Yoha. Yes. Um, can I just make a comment, Prof? Um, but control goes to the participants. Thank you for your your time. Uh, there will be a, a documentation sent out summarizing the deliberations we've had in this session, and that document will also have uh, contact information for the the panelists and uh, also those of you that might want to uh, reach out to us at Eco Connect as well. Let me also remind you that um, in an hour's time or less than an hour's time, where there's a session on, um, on funding and um, innovation in funding. So a lot of questions came up about funding. We'll be having uh, speakers from TED Fund and international funders in that session. So um, maybe those of you who are here might want to join that session, which starts at 1 p.m. Um, and again, I just want to, uh, what I took away from this, I want to thank the speakers as well. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, they said to us as an r &E community is to basically, we need to formulate a plan, you know, of what our challenges are. Um, and we really need to consider very strongly uh, shared platforms and cloud platforms uh, to, to move forward. So for me, Prof, sir, I'd like to thank you as well for the excellent mod, uh, moderation you've provided for this session. And uh, uh, those of you who did have questions that were not answered, we apologize, we couldn't take them for a lack of time, but please um, feel free to still send your questions to us and uh, we will endeavor to try and have them answered. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in the session at 1 p.m. So Prof, sir, uh, back over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ewa. Well, I think uh, we've come to the end of uh, the, the session. Uh, we kindly request you to join us at the next session at uh, 1 p.m. You're most welcome. Thank you. <laughs>